Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast exploring Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And I'm Jimmy Fowler, elder candidate at Redeemer Fellowship. You didn't leave off your title this time. Yeah, I'm executive pastoral assistant at Redeemer Fellowship. Yeah, I like that. You've been going, you've been leading with that well, because, because you're never, keeps talking you're about never going to wrap up your elder candidate. I am going to wrap it up. It should Listen, be... you're taking away time from our guest. Okay. Hey, I'm just saying. Okay, just uh, hang on. Just Why stop. are you cutting I know me you off? Like I don't talk. appreciate okay. this aggression that you're throwing my way. I well, have a voice, sir. You, I have you, a voice. We all know that you do. I, we've heard you sing. Yeah. We've, you're welcome. We've heard bro. you harp. We've harp? Heard what does you harp mean? Carp? Uh, Google it. Carp. Look it up. You'll find it out. Carp? What is yeah, that? Don't worry about it. Uh, well, listen, we have uh, a special guest with us. You guys know that we don't do like your basic interview podcast stuff, but when we have the opportunity and the occasion to sit down with another person, we like to do that today uh, in the studio, which is just my office. Um, we have a church member here from Redeemer with us. His name is Jeffrey Babineau. What's up, Jeff? Hey, how are you doing? We're doing good, man. I'm doing good. I'm feeling good today. I'm going to go home, and you know what I'm going to watch? Lethal, Lethal Weapon. Weapon. I'm going to watch I my Lethal it. Weapon TV it. series. It's good. Does it, a new one come out tonight? Is that why you're watching it? Yeah. But what time then? You have to watch it at like midnight. No, 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 no. It's, it, uh, when I when, get when home, I watch it, it. Really? Does it download? What time does it download? If, if, it can't, if, if the episode it. played tonight. You, DVRs and everything. It's you all good. Have, wait a second. You uh, don't have, have DVR. You were wrong. We, have, we just got DVRs. So hold on. You're telling okay. me you let's have TV. No, 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 no. Let's move on. I just want to no, talk about what we're Because I think I know what's going on here. You do not know what's going on here. You are pirating the show. I would never, and I have never, pirated anything. Now, you are using a TV app on your computer. Nope. I don't think you know what you're talking about. So today. you actually have a, t- you have a TV and you're watching it live tonight I as have, it airs, or are you doing it on iTunes? Which one? I have a TV that gets this channel. I can watch it as a DVR recorded thing. I can watch it on demand. I can watch it in a several different ways. Okay. The, the point is- I did not know you upgraded that, it. Yeah, I did, actually. We just I know upgraded it. That, that's why I said I did um, so get, no, I'm just talking. I'm trying to introduce Jeffrey. Okay, Gabinette. whatever, man. I'm just trying to make sure we all know that Joe doesn't steal TV. I don't, but you I, made I know, it sound well, like I do because I kind of thought maybe you did. Mm, I'm gonna sometimes. call you out on it sometimes. Um, so Jeff and I uh, and Jim, we've been friends for for years now. I mean, how long have we known each other? Five years now. Five, Five years. Six years wow. now. And you came out of what kind of a church context? I came out of an independent fundamentalist Baptist church background. Uh, King hot. James only. Yeah, oh yeah. Sound, sound pretty good time? <laughs> Fun times. Great times. Yep. Now, I, I know like, you know, when, when I met uh, Jeffrey, he was um, very serious about theology, very serious about the Bible. Um, he's a knowledgeable guy coming out of a context that he found himself at. You find yourself at odds with it, really, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. But you, you never, you've never bashed that church. I've, I've never heard you. You might poke fun in the way that we all poke fun at each other. Yeah, yeah. But like you were, you were very care. You were, you seem to say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm going to. It, you seem to say <laughs> that you were well cared for while you were there by a lot of the people. Uh, I was. Um, a lot of people I'm still friends with. I keep relationships with, and um, you know, Facebook friends. And I play golf with some of my friends from yeah. the old ministry. Um, no, the, the people there were, were very loving. They, um, had a heart for, uh, for missions and for the community and for the Lord. Um, it was just, you know, we hear the horror stories. We see the people like, uh, the Steve Andersons of the world, stuff right. like that. And yeah. I, our church wasn't that over the top. It was just, it had its, uh, click about it that it was, uh, uptight on some things that weren't really as scripturally sound as they are. But for the most part, um, the church is actually has moved on from those stances that they once held. They're not KJV only anymore, are they? They're not K, uh, King James Version only anymore. Uh, they're ESV only now. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they've, they've moved on. They've um, adopted a CCM music, and they've kind of... Uh, have they're reforming, not as reformed as we are at Redeemer, but they're uh, slowly but surely they're mm-hmm. they're making that turn towards cool. that direction. 
Well, um, we all uh, get to hang out a lot because, yeah. uh, you know, Jeff's not just a, a member at Redeemer, but he's a cigar smoker. And so uh, we hang out at the cigar shop quite a bit. Jeffrey's a locker member there, uh, like a lot of us. And so uh, we've developed a pretty close relationship. And um, over the years, I, I've, I've had occasion to not just hang out with Jeffrey, but disciple him and uh, meet with him. And so we've talked about everything from the the deepest, darkest stuff to the lightest and most fun things. And today on the episode here on the podcast, we're going to go pretty serious. And if you're listening, you already know what it's about, right? It's it's right there in the title. We're going to talk about sexual abuse in the church. Um, and there are a lot of reasons that we want to talk about this. Um, the, the rate of sexual assault and rape is is frighteningly high. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, it's actually, it's actually fallen like 63% since 1993. So there, there's been a huge reduction um, over the years in the numbers that are reported at least. Um, but still, every 98 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. Every 98 seconds, it's going on. Wow. Um, and every eight minutes, that victim is a child. And out of every 1,000... Uh, scumbag perpetrators, only six of them will end up in prison. That, I, I mean, just the, the stats, even though you say it's fallen 63%, it's still way too high. It's insane. It's insane. It is absolutely nuts. It's horrible. Uh, and just even the fact that, like you said, only six out of every thousand. That's astonishing, yeah. That to I me, didn't know that. That's, that's sickening crazy. to me. It is. So why talk about such a... Why, why talk about a big deal like this? Why talk about such a painful dark? Like, we have a pretty light show. Yeah. We, talk, we talk about theology. Yeah. Uh, we crack a lot of jokes. But what the heck? Why are we talking about this? Because no one else is. Like, or I shouldn't say no one else. Maybe that's, a, that's too you know, overgeneral. Most people are not. Very few are going to talk, are gonna about, talk about such a serious topic because it is, it is a, it's a difficult thing to discuss. You know, you're talking about innocence being stolen right. you're talking about uh victims that you one you know uh have maybe never fully dealt with or gotten oh, over because yeah. it's how do you get how do you deal with something like this yeah. and and continue on uh but then also you never know right you never know because it's something that is it's not like you kind of throw that out there yeah, you when you first it. meet somebody yeah you know, hey, my name is so and so. This, is this happened history. to me. Yeah. You know, like it's just not it's just not something you're going to talk about. People don't talk about it. Um, and I also think, sorry, I also think uh, there's a stigma in society right. about it where, uh, unfortunately, there have been instances where uh, victims are treated as. Uh, I know what you're saying. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they're yeah. treated as if they somehow brought it upon themselves yeah, as if somehow they're to blame they're culpable in some way exactly um, and we've even seen that happen uh in churches yeah uh where kids have been abused in church contexts that's right and um it's not dealt with they're not protected so we want to talk about it because people aren't talking about it enough because most churches are not prepared to deal with it yeah uh whether that's people coming into their church who have been sexually abused or when there is sexual abuse that happens in some way connected yeah, to they don't know church. how to respond to it they don't have a plan yeah, and also the thing, the reality is, we are in a fallen, we are in a fallen, sinful world, and this, this, uh, the sexual abuse in the church is a real problem. Yeah, it, and it that's is. why we have to talk about it. You can't just ignore it. You can't just sweep it under the rug. You can't just act like it's not there. Right. It right. needs to be discussed, brought into light, dealt with severely. So there's, there is one other reason why we're talking about this, um, and it's because it's very close to our hearts. Um, we know people who have been sexually abused, and uh, I have been sexually abused when I was a kid. Jeffrey was sexually abused when he was a kid. And so there are a lot of feelings wrapped up in this, not just we understand that this is a problem that needs to be dealt with, um, there are people in our church whose children were the victims of sexual abuse. Like th- this touches all of us in all of these ways. So we feel this. It is important to us. It's very, very close. Now, you know, in, in my case, I was a young kid who was exposed to 
what then was called hardcore pornography. It was pre-internet, of course. And, um, and now that's probably just mainstream pornography on the internet today. But I was exposed to that as a early, at a very early age. And then later on, uh, was, uh, was assaulted over a period of time, uh, by an individual. And, uh, I, I, that, I carry that with me today. Yeah. And I know Jeff, you, you understand that, uh, as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, when I was a teenager, I was, um, I was basically, I, um, I was raped by somebody. Um, I was lured to the back of an abandoned church um, where somebody um, attacked me, and um, I was raped. And, um, yeah, that's something uh, for years I told just basically family members and very close, close friends. And... Um, you know, we hide things like that for years. Like Jimmy, you were saying, you yeah. know, people don't talk about it. It's something you just don't say, Hey, I'm Jeff. I was raped. You know what I mean? It's something yeah. you don't talk about, but yeah, it, it especially happens. as a, as a man, mm -hmm. right? Because exactly. who, like we're men, right. we're going to take care of business. Yeah. And to then say like, wow, uh, there was a time when I was completely the victim was and selfish, yeah. yeah. And, and it, and I feel it today. It's done something to me today. I mean, you've experienced the consequences of that mm -hmm. in in a variety of ways. Right. Um, it's it's had an impact on you that you that I don't even think you recognized like the impact that it had on you in some of the ways until not too long ago. Not too long ago, exactly. Um, one of the people I told outside of my family and my very close, tight knit friends um, was my wife Cindy. Um, basically. Um, I remember the first time I told her that I loved her, you know, I was opening up, we we're being honest about ourselves is that, and I told her about what happened to me. And, um, and the funny thing is though, on top of me opening up and telling her about it, I also, I would hide it. Mm -hmm. I would bury it. And, um, and a lot of times it would come out, um, in ways of, anger and stuff and I remember um, one day in particular I don't think my wife and I were married yet but we were driving down the street and we were having an argument I was upset about some I don't remember but then um, my wife well, girlfriend at the time said you've got to talk to somebody about this and I was like talk to somebody about what she goes about what happened to you and you know I slammed on the brakes, pulled the car over, and I accused, like, my mother of telling her. I said, you know, I was asking You her, didn't remember telling her? I don't remember telling her. And I'm like, what did my mother tell you? And I'm like, in my wife's face. Because this is, this is like the darkest, most vulnerable yeah. part of you. Like, right. she's not supposed to know this. She's not supposed to know this. You know, what did my mother tell you? And I was, and then my wife recalled the story when I told her. And as she was telling it, it, it was all coming back to me. And I was like, I buried that. Yeah. And... Um, and even though my wife was urging me to talk to somebody or to seek help for it, yeah. I, I want to do it, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, uh, you know, call it pride or what have you, something you just don't brag about. Part of my struggle growing up, and, and I know this sounds strange, um, when it first happened to me, like the first year or two, like, it was just, it was water under the bridge. It was like, mm -hmm. I, I almost forgot about it. It was like, you know what? It happens. It goes on, whatever. But I think as I grew older, um, the, like you were saying, there's that stigma of being mm -hmm. a man. And in certain parts of society, men who are, who have been abused or raped, you know, are, you know, you're not looked too kindly upon. And I think with me was that when I would get into confrontations or it, you know, things were escalating, I would in a sense bring that up and use that as fuel. Like in your mind. Yeah. Like in my mind, yeah. like saying, All right, this happened to me once and I know you don't know what happened to me, but I'm going to show you I'm not that, you know, helpless, not a punk. little punk anymore. Yeah. You know, and that would just really like 
like throwing gas on a fire for me. Jeff's pretty open about this, yeah. but uh, Jeff is obviously about this, but I'm, I'm referring to his, um, you know, his, his anger issues. And um, we read a book together uh, called Quest for Meekness and Quietness of Spirit. By Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry yeah. How good is that book? Awesome, yeah. man. I've seen I've seen God work in, in yep. Jeffrey's life in tremendous. We all have in tremendous ways to see that struggle and that fight um, over rage and anger um, begin to be conquered. Now it's still there. It's like in all of us, our struggles continue. But yeah. God's really been at work. So Jeffrey, you don't you have to picture Jeffrey. Jeffrey's a big guy. Um, he's not a monster or a mountain man or anything. He's a big guy. Well, uh, he's tall. Well, he's yeah, he's tall he's because very he's, tall to me. Yeah, he well, everyone's really tall. Yeah, to but me. he's really tall to me. Everyone's really tall, and he's to lost me. a bunch of weight. He's lost, a, yeah, exactly. But you know, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, if if you know how to fight, or if you know people who do fight, and you watch Jeffrey walk into a room, you know that's a guy who knows how to fight. Yeah, Jeffrey, uh, and yeah, he doesn't mind to do it. He, he's like he'll oblige you, mm-hmm. um, and so that oh, yeah. that yeah. R- rage that that was so deep down, right? was just constantly fueled by that that burning fire of your past uh, abuse. And so it, it it matters to Jeffrey. And when when we were able to see, when you were able to see and articulate, wow, a lot of my current sin struggles even and, and just my current frustrations in life stem from that event. Right. That really started to unlock a lot of things for you. It was really... Right. It finally... Um... It, it came to a point one night where I had a, a real bad argument with my in-laws. And, um, you know, like Joe was saying, we've been talking and discussing yeah. and counseling about my anger and stuff. And, you know, I went home that night from that real bad argument. Um, I know my wife was at her wit's end. And, um, you know, I'm like, I can't get a hold of this. This is something that is just, it's killing me. And... um I think we met the following like Tuesday or Wednesday to talk. And um, I was like, my wife's right about this. You know, this is not, this has to be something that I haven't confronted yet in my life. And that's when you told and me that first time? That was yeah. Yeah, the first yeah. time we were at Lviv. And Jeff's like, I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with <laughs> my anger issues. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> like, okay, let's, let's talk about that. Uh, but then it was like click, 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 and yeah. God started like yeah. just peeling back all the layers and man, it was just awesome to see God at work and how God's been at work in you, Jeff. Um, so this is why we're talking about it. Yeah. Um, and so all, really what we want to do here is we wanted to give you a peek into reality. Uh, Redeemer is a church that is real. Uh, now it doesn't mean that we're never fake. All of us can be fake. Oh yeah. Uh, we all struggle with that from yeah, time to time. Pretend. But by and large, and we have a congregation here at our church that is transparent with each other. Yeah. And so I our CGs, DGs within as we do life together. I've I've seen Jeffrey, who had never shared this with anybody outside of a very small group of people, share it with a couple of guys in a matter of a month, right. um, whom he didn't know very well. Yeah. Because it was relevant to the conversation and it would be it would be it was important. So we have this kind of openness here, which allows us to see a lot of the garbage and crap that goes on in real life. Um, I, the reason Jeffrey's on is because Jeffrey said, hey, if you wind up talking about that issue, I'm willing to come on and 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 join that conversation so you have somebody that's gone through yeah. what, I, what I would consider to be the most extreme form uh, of this abuse for a man to go through. Now, um, this is we, we do this because we want you to know, like, this is in your church. This is in your church. Yeah. Like, this is not just at Redeemer. This is at every church. You've got people who, I mean, look at the statistics. Um, what? It's uh, 1.6 persons per 1,000. Yeah. So uh, for every 1,000 person, you That was know, in 2015. Right. So you're, 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 you're likely to have people who uh, have been victims of sexual assault and rape. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you're just talking about attempted sexual assault, which is traumatic for people in and of itself. Yeah. Like you've got people in there and we need to understand what's going on in the lives of the people who have been victimized, how we can help, and then how we can prevent um, this sort of a thing from happening on church. So number one, let's just talk about this. What are some things that we need to know about people who are victims of of sexual abuse? And uh, if any come to mind, Jeff, you go ahead and, and speak up. But when you think of people who are who have experienced this kind of a trauma what do we need to know about them well i think 
first, I mean, I think sometimes people just feel alone. Right. Right. They feel like they have no one to talk to. You know, it's you mentioned that earlier, right? Yeah, exactly. They can't. They can't. They can't. You don't know how. Right. And and again, there can sometimes be that perception. You talked about that, Jeff, Mm -hmm. about that perception of like, especially as a man, that I was overtaken by somebody else. Somehow I feel lesser or inferior. Right. People are going to view me as that. They're going to view me as as less of a man. Uh, and so you don't know how to go through it. And the uh, the flip side, the other side of that is uh, some churches or some people, m- they they won't call it manipulation. I'm going to call it abuse uh, where they somehow tell the individual like they somehow make them feel like it's their fault. Yeah. Right. right? Well, you shouldn't have been there. You should have known better. You know, you should have kind of gone a different way or something like that. I don't know. Without going into details, you got some of that pushback in general, some experience, some of like, there were some questions kind of cast your way in the midst of that event, I think, that made you feel like, what did I do? Yeah. Um, some family members were questioning, like, what was I doing? Why wasn't I smart enough to see yeah. what was happening? And it's like... It's a wrong question to ask. You know, yeah. I mean, and believe me, there was others that were like, I don't want to repeat here, of course. And, um, yeah, there was just, you know, some things that made it, you know, worse. Um, but like I said earlier, it, it didn't really bother me that much at first. I, I did chalk that up to just ignorant comments. Um, my family was great for me. You know, they were there supportive, and um, I am thankful for that. But like I said, for me, it, it affected me further on down the road mm-hmm. later in life is where it really started to. Well, yeah. some people, they really struggle with guilt and shame, yeah. even though it's not their fault. Exactly. They didn't deserve this. They didn't do this, but they feel guilty. They feel dirty. They feel like they could have done something right. different maybe. Yeah. Um, and they oftentimes will turn to – uh, hurting themselves. Yeah. Right. I mean, one of the one of the common, I don't want to say natural, but one of the common consequences of abuse is alcoholism and addiction. Yeah. And suicide even. I and mean, people just lose all hope. Yeah, I mean, cuz part of that is is dealing with well, they're dealing with the pain and they don't know how to deal with the pain. And even as you were talking about, sometimes it reacts or it it manifests itself in anger. So it's not just sometimes they're hurting themselves, but sometimes it could be hurting others verbally. You know, as well as they're as maybe they're reacting against, you know, what has gone on. Um, I mean, what about what about how it impacts their understanding and their view of God? Yeah, I mean, you think that that is it possible, Jeff, for um, somebody to experience this level of suffering and have it change the way that they view God? Uh, it's kind of hard for me to answer that. I wasn't a believer then. Um, you know, I mean, I've come to the understanding now in life that, you know, everything has a purpose. You know, the evil in the world, you know, God has a purpose for that. What it is, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I could see where somebody would question why God would allow that yeah, to sure. happen to them. Um, maybe I question that. But again, that for me, I mean, I'm looking at it now, looking back through more of a, a biblical perspective right rather than um you know just you know not knowing god like i like i didn't know him at that time when that happened yeah but it, it can definitely you know start to to haunt people's theology you know when they don't have uh some sort of biblical framework that helps them to process when they don't have you know counselors or pastors and friends mm-hmm. that can speak truth to them it yeah. can really you know put them in a bad way so you know there's a lot to know about uh, those people that have been uh, experienced or victimized, um, experienced sexual abuse. Um, and so we're just talking about a few things. But we, we mentioned these because I know from my, my experience from working with other people, you know, it just as a pastor walking people through yeah. these things, uh, we've had people in our church who have been raped while they were members here. They, they were raped, obviously, by somebody. I shouldn't say obviously, because sometimes it is from a, a church yeah. member. But they were raped off-site, and they had to go through this um, by somebody else. They, like, we need to understand that, um, that they're in our churches, that these are people that are feeling alone. Uh, they don't have anyone to talk to. They feel guilt and shame. They're 
they might be tempted to hurt themselves. They might be struggling with their view of God. So in light of all of that, what can we do as churches to, um, to help? What kind of a culture do we have to create that would be, that would create not just a safe place, Mm -hmm. but a redemptive place for people that are going through this? Well, I think you kind of mentioned at the beginning, um, and that is there needs to be a culture of vulnerability and acceptance, right? There, you know, for um, for some people, and I, and I don't want to put words in, in Jeff's mouth, you know, but, you know, Jeff trusts, he trusts Joe. I think, I think there's, I think I could say that, right, yeah. you know, and you felt safe sharing with Joe. And I think Joe vice versa. Right. And I think part of that is if you didn't feel that safeness, if you didn't feel the love, if you didn't feel the, uh, a trust for people. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you felt like the church was a condemning kind of a church and not one that's willing to shepherd people through difficult situations, I think it's, it's hard for people to open up then. Right. I think that's really good. I think that might be the most basic and important thing that churches yeah. can do is to foster that kind of culture. I also think that... And, and hold on, I yeah. want to say, you're going to foster that or at least educate people on on that because they watch how you interact mm-hmm. in all other spheres of life. They're going to watch how you interact with those that are struggling with alcohol. They're going to watch how you interact with those who are struggling in their marriage. They're going to watch how you interact with those that are going through tough times in their life. And they see how are you going to, how are you going to be showing the love, grace and mercy and forgiveness and love of God in the midst of that. Then yes, this, this might be a safe place for me. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when I'm able to share my struggle with, uh, with pride or with gossip or with pornography or with alcohol or, and I'm, and I'm all I'm receiving is love care. Um, now that doesn't mean, you know, uh, people just letting you saying, go ahead and do whatever you want and justifying it. Right. But you know, there's a difference between loving and caring someone in the midst of that and walking with them and condemning them right away. And so that, that's kind of, I just want to make sure I say that they're going to yeah. watch how you handle every other situation. And I, that's, what's important here. And so that, that requires education. Yeah. Right. The, the leadership needs to be educated for sure. They need to be reading um, articles, books, uh, not just on the statistics. And we'll have a bunch of things listed yeah. as resources uh, in our show notes. So be sure and check those out because none of y'all are reading enough on this. In that I'm talking to myself first and then to everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we need to be reading more. So um, we need to be educating ourselves to understand the issues, um, the people, but then also we need to educate ourselves so that we know how to best help. Right. So there needs to be pastoral care and counseling going on. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, like some people will need professional counseling, like beyond what the church can offer. And so if we don't. And that's not a slam against the church or the staff of the church. That's a recognition that there are. This is not about you. This is not about you as a pastor. This is not about you, you know, feeling like you're useful. This is about how do you properly uh, care and love your brother or sister in Christ. Right. And listen, you uh, pastors, elders of the church, uh, deacons, uh, you know, lay ministers, all of these people can only do so much. Mm-hmm. When somebody needs long-term uh, care at, at a very deep level, you need a specialist. You need somebody yeah. who's really gifted, qualified, and ready. So you need to be, if you don't have those kinds of people in your church, then you need to know people locally that you can refer them to. There are several counselors professional counselors in our church who happen to be professional counselors as well as outside of our church that we recommend people to go to for a variety of issues. And we wind up recommending them a lot because all of our people are jacked up. Um, Just look at the leadership. Yeah, just look at us. That's why I'm not an elder. I'm only only an elder candidate. I'm not as messed up as some other pastors, Joe Thorne. The only difference between our church and most other churches is that uh, we know we're jacked up. Yeah, that's that's true. That's the main difference. So... I think that's another thing. So yeah, I think and what you said is the culture yep. of acceptance, of transparency, education. What else? Well, and I, part of that education, and I don't even know how to, is this, and I'm asking the question if this is even a viable thing, but learning, like educating yourself on recognizing 
those that are hurting. Yeah, just like the signs of people that are hurting, maybe. Yeah. Maybe victims of something, but maybe not. But yeah, yeah just being able to properly diagnose, like, wow, somebody. Something seems a little off here or yeah. something they, they, you know, how do you, how do you kind of recognize that, pray for them and, and see, you know, how do you engage life? But, you know, people, people can, cause especially if it happened, you know, long ago, they've learned how to kind right. of hide and, and things like that. Like even like, you know, with both of you, like I would not have known anything except for you guys telling me, you know, yeah. and sharing with me and, and, you know. Uh, I wouldn't have, and that's so, but how do you, you know, with others, there might be some telltale signs, not just of, of past history, but I think there's also, there could be telltale signs of recent mm. activity. And that's what we need to, uh, leaders need to educate themselves right. on is learning. How do I recognize that, uh, try to at least best as possible, uh, recognize a sign of. Mm -hmm. That abuse has just transpired. So the question then has to be, how can churches protect their people and right. their children from sexual abuse? Right. And, I, you know, it's not just doctors that look for those things. Teachers in public schools look for these things. Yeah. Like, so they, there are protocols everywhere. Nurses, yep. healthcare officials. Most Michelle had to go through that in, in Canada, learning how to recognize abuse, right. spousal abuse and, and child abuse. Every time I take my wife in uh, to the doctor for anything, they always look at me and they look at her, they pull her aside and they ask her if she feels safe. <laughs> and they really do. I mean, they actually well, do. Well, you know what? Next time I go to the doctor, I need to let them know. I don't really feel safe around the JoJo. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you, you shouldn't. I don't. But, like, they're doing that because they're trying to be proactive. They're trying to make sure, like, hey, listen, is everything okay? Um, so how can churches protect their people? Let's just say this on the front end. Let's just put scripture on this to make it very clear. Right, good. Psalm 82, verses 3 and 4, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. This is our responsibility as the people of God that we don't just look out for ourselves, that we look out for those around us, especially those who cannot defend themselves, especially those who need rescue. And, and you said the people of God, and I agree. That, that it's, but I'm going to say specifically to the leadership of the church. Absolutely. Because uh, there have been instances oh, yeah. of church leadership turning a blind eye. And that, to me, is not just horrific. It is sinful. It is shameful. And... I, I, we, I, I, mean, I don't want, I, part of me doesn't want to say names. You know, I don't yeah, want I to. I'm trying not to be like that, but I am sick to my stomach of knowing that a church that has wanted to proclaim the glory of God right. is willing to turn their back on, on children and women. Just, it, it's, I just can't, when I read something like that, right. you have, I'm going to use a charismatic term. You have lost the mantle, yeah. right? Like you, you are no longer in my mind, truly willing. You don't really care for the glory of God. You, you care for the glory of your church and your reputation. And to me, I'm trying really hard. You know, I am. No, I, I there's so many words I want to use that I know I can't. You are sick. There is, you are sick. There have been a, there are plenty of examples in, that have played out in the, in the last few years yeah. of churches that perhaps have not uh, been guilty of committing sexual abuse, but have covered it up. That to me is still you're guilty. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. You are guilty. They, they, I mean, they have. We have these bizarre and twisted accounts of how they uh, quote unquote counseled the children. Yeah. Uh, they neglected to involve the police. All of this is crap. It needs to be um, addressed. And you networks and associations that are willing to continue on with this and turn your blind yep. eye to it, you are just as guilty in my mind of that. If you are, all you, what you are doing is communicating that what they have done and the cover up that they have, that they have, that they have done is justified and right. You are justifying their sin of covering it up. You know, we were talking about this recently, uh, this this sort of a thing uh, with uh, another podcaster. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that he said is that in, in some tribes, one doctrinal truth yeah, yeah. Tr will trump everything else. So as long as we're all agreed on, like, the sovereignty of God and salvation, yeah. as long as we're all agreed on this basic Calvinistic soteriology, 
Some groups will say we can overlook just about everything else. Yeah. And we won't have to address, we won't have to deal with it. So um, we find this heinous sin. Yeah. And not okay. The reason that we don't name names uh, on this kind of things is because we don't really know all no. of the information. Um and that's right. So when it comes to opinions, I'm, I'm, we're, we're happy to share our opinions, but we're not going to call people out specifically because we're not involved in those cases. Yeah. But uh, we are, are definitely um, ready to deal with any problem that happens in our networks or in our denomination or in our church. And so, in, in our church plant. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's just go through some basics here. I mean, I think first you got to start with you need to develop a formal sexual abuse and misconduct prevention program right you need to have something in place you need to have something in place that like in canada they called it uh uh plan to protect right Mm -hmm. i was known as the plan to protect you know like guy at our church because we i had to implement that within our church um it's something that is there to to protect and it includes it includes a zero tolerance stance yep. for sexual abuse and misconduct uh, for anyone involved with the church and particularly for at risk individuals. You know, uh, I think there's part of that then is is kind of what we're talking about. It's not about covering up, right? But I know at Redeemer, the cops are called. Oh, we would call. Yeah, we haven't had to, but yeah, we would. The uh, cops would be called, right? You don't you don't just sweep it under the rug. You don't just try to counsel the person to uh, get over it. Uh, though they wouldn't say it like that, but ultimately that's what that's what they're trying to get you to do. Um, you you prosecute, and so yeah. with this, there comes two controls or two kind of. There's two stages to it. One is there's chaperones. You know, there's background checks should be required for all volunteers and paid chaperones. So even like our children's ministry here, yeah, anybody our, that has anything to do with any kids, they get a thorough background check. We pay yeah. for it. It's uh, and it's worth it. We make sure that we know. And people and adults don't go to the bathroom with kids alone. No, nope. never. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, and then at risk individuals, you know, children, individuals with diminished mental or physical capacity should be attended to by more than one person, eliminating one on one interaction. Yeah. And part of that for us is we've already kind of got that because we don't have one on ones. We don't. Yeah. We just for the protection of our children, for the protection of. Of individuals and and for our volunteers, yeah, you know it's it, it. I know it's a lot of work, and I know especially in smaller churches where y'all know each other and y'all love each other and like you babysit each other's kids, you don't feel like it matters, but it does. Yes. and as your church grows, it it is absolutely critical. Yeah, I remember reading a stat in Canada when we were doing the plan to protect thing, and this was a staggering stat. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember being blown away by it. But the mentality, what what it was essentially was that smaller churches were at a greater risk. Mm. Smaller churches in small towns are at a greater risk because you have that trusting... Yeah. You know, you and have no that, safeguards. You have no... You have your trust and you have no safeguards. I mean, there was churches... I remember at one one Sunday, they're like, man, we don't have anyone uh, to do nursery. Does anyone want to volunteer? Yeah. And this new person just kind of ro- you know, raised their hand and like, all right, go ahead. What's your name? Go ahead and head back there. And I'm like... I'm going back there with that yeah. guy. That's I have no guy. idea who you is. You never want the guy that's volunteering to go watch the kids. You, no, want, whatever, you well, want the guy that doesn't want to go. You're like, you're going. No, that's not true. Jeff. What? Jeff. Uh, sorry, Jeff Willie. I'm just that saying. That man volunteered. Okay, that, but he's that, an exception to the rule. I want you to know, we stayed at the church because of Jeff. Yeah, I know. I'm saying that's I'm an exception saying, to the rule. Jeff, you told the story. Elder, you told the story. He's our eldest elder. Tell he it again. Is, okay, he's the eldest elder. And uh, he is always in the children's ministry. He's always in the nursery. He's always there with the kids. He's always volunteering uh, to take care. Elders of don't do that. What are you talking about? Uh, no, man. He's, he, no, that that he's was the mentality elder. I had to learn that it ain't beneath. He, he, for him, he's like, this is the way I'm going to serve. Yeah. I'm going to serve our people by caring for their children. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to hold their child. Grandpa. I'm going to pray for them. Yep. My kids love coming into church mm-hmm. and they run right up to Jeff. They don't do that with me. They they don't really like you. No, I know. You almost I, said they hate me. I was I saw, about to. I saw you about I know, to say it. I know. All right, Joe, what number else? two. Um, well, th- this relates to, a, there's a couple of things here. Um, you there's, there's basic things like you should have locks on doors. Yeah, you yeah. should, you know, have everything kind of separated out so that kids are, are safe. Um, but one of the things that people don't think about is is how do you deal with people who have a history of sexual abuse yeah. or a person who's been convicted of a crime? 
like like this? How do you uh, do you turn them away? I'll tell you what, the gut reaction of every Christian I know without exception is you molested a kid, you should either be put to death or banished to an island and you better not step into my church. That's the gut reaction of pretty much every church, every Christian that I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's my I'm, gut. I'm willing to say, yeah. That, yeah. That's my gut reaction. That is mine. That's my gut reaction. Now, I know that's not the right reaction. Um, so, because we, we do believe that God saves the worst of us. Yes. And believe me, that guy is not necessarily the worst of us. I'm no better. I've done different sins, different crimes, but I'm There are no, different consequences, right? earthly, different, whatever different you want to Different consequences, say. absolutely. So, if God is at work in an individual, if God is, like, do what do you do? You say there's no grace for you? Or if you're going, and I know this is controversial, I know that this is hard for some people to swallow, especially for guys that have gone through this. Yeah, it's or hard for me to have, swallow as you're talking. But if the gospel is to be indiscriminately preached to all, if grace is truly for all, then it's for those people too. See, like, on one level, I agree with you. On another level, you know, like part, and maybe that's just the sinfulness of me, right? Like that's just my, like, my, my gut, you know, my humanity, whatever right. you want to say is like, well, uh, listen, I disagree. I, I'm so, I, but, I, but you're not saying, you're not saying, uh, don't be wise. No, that's I'm, I'm going to get to that. What Joe is saying, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to the like what churches can do here specifically. Gotcha. Sorry, I did not know that. And I so, was, but what I'll say though is, listen, um, I'm not opposed to capital punishment. I'm opposed to the way America does it because I think that we wind up killing a bunch of innocent people. So I'm not I really not really a big And that's you learn that from your true crime podcast. Uh yes, I do, as a matter of fact. But um also <laughs> See Jeff's laughing. Thank you, Jeff. Oh shut up, shut up. <laughs> I finally got so I got only two of you beating up on me. Um but I'm I but I I do think there's a place for capital punishment and I yeah. think uh rape and molestation are just causes for capital punishment. I, I I don't if if, you, if if we got video evidence, we know that you did this. We got D, like DNA, like whatever. All right, fine. Okay. Um, so uh, just to put it all out there, I'm just trying to be honest with everybody. Yeah, yeah. So when it comes to a person that has a, a background or a history, uh, this is pretty simple in my mind. Not easy, but simple. Uh, that person is never allowed anywhere in that church without a chaperone. Yeah, absolutely. I think he, if he goes to the bathroom, he goes with a chaperone. If uh, if she's uh, if she's gonna. Be, go to the picnic, there's somebody always with her. I yep. mean, if you've done this sort of a thing, then the consequences are you need to be held accountable and we need to protect the body. So this is the thing. Pastors are called to protect the body. Yep. Now, there are some situations in which, you know, we had a person commit a crime, not on church grounds, but we had a person that was connected to our church that committed a crime that was heinous and yep. big. And uh, he's in jail. He's been in jail for quite a while now. Um, if he comes out, he will not be welcomed back at this church because my responsibility is to protect this church. I'm not yeah. against reconciliation and trying to build anything, but I got to protect this body. But I would try very hard to help him find a church yeah, where yeah. they could That'd care for him and help him. So I'm not saying that it's 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 an easy situation, but if you're going to have somebody in your church that you find has a background, number one, um, don't throw them out the door. Try to find out what happened. The way the laws are written, sometimes. You know, an 18-year-old and a 17-year-old have sex, and the 18-year-old is prosecuted, and he's branded a child molester or something. Yeah. It, you know, sometimes it's not exactly what you think it is when you see it written up on the Internet. So try and find out what it is. Make sure that they are chaperoned. Make sure that the church understands yeah. what's going on and what, how, why the situation is. I think that's just part of the consequence, that the church needs to be informed. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's why we also say we don't do one-on-one. -on -one. Never. And I, I, don't, I don't go one-on-one. -on -one um, like I'm talking about my, when I, in Canada with youth, when I, I worked with young life of Canada, I would I would never, I would not be one-on-one -on -one with a, with yep. a guy or a girl. And part of that was, uh, one's perception. The mm -hmm. other part of it is there are, unfortunately, you know, uh, there are some that make false accusations. Yeah. And so for the protection of myself and for my wife and for our family and for the kids, I would tell my leaders, you are not allowed to be one on one. That's just I know not a man. Happen. I know a godly man, a servant of the church, not at Redeemer, who uh, was ministering with uh, the youth. Uh, good man all the way around. Uh, was in a situation where he had to drive one of the youth home, and uh, this young lady later uh, said that he had come on to her somehow. Uh, you know, tried something. 
And of course, it was taken very seriously. Of course. And he was mortified. And in the end, she admitted that she had made it up. That she was, you know, whatever, seeking attention. She was mad about something. The damage has been done. Right. So it's really, really dangerous. So you've got to, you've got to definitely, yeah. um, and part have of that, plan all that, for that, you got to plan for that. But all that then means you need to establish some sort of training yeah. for your leadership. You need to, for your volunteers, right? You need to let them know how to, protect themselves and how to protect children and how to women. identify that's what you talked about earlier how to identify when exactly you see so you need to have i know for us we would do and i think we do like we do here at redeemer as well yeah is a yearly training time with everyone that has been part of the part i feel of like to do it more ministry. than once a year it feels like it happens like twice a year it, it does happen quite often you might be right that's twice a year you know pat's we, on that pat's, pat's on, on that and you know pastor pat takes very seriously very seriously there's there's he Two things he's serious about. He is serious. Three things. His pipe, but his, he's serious about the gospel and, and, and the disciple of our, discipleship of our children. Just go look at my wife's Facebook page where my kids are singing songs of praise and they're, you know, two and a half, four years old. Uh, Pat takes that very seriously. How do we disciple our kids? And then he, their safety yeah. takes that very seriously. So there needs to be that training time. That's on his mind and heart all the time. All the time. Yeah. You know, and so you, we, how do you, how do you protect our kids and how do you protect our volunteers? You need to train them in our policy and our procedure, but then also then come, you know, any tips on, on prevention yeah. and things like that. But then also, how do you respond to allegations? Yeah. What is that process for that? You know, uh, if you hear of something, I mean, I would, I would tell kids, I was just honest, you know, kids would say, I need to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody. And I would say, depends on what you say. Yeah. There's a difference between confidentiality and secrecy. That's it. Um, and so, yeah, I'll hold these things in confidence, but if I have to tell somebody for your safety or for your good or That's for somebody it. else, I'm going to I do would, it. I'd be upfront. If, if you've been hurt, if, you, you, if you've been hurt or you're planning on hurting somebody else, yeah. I, I am going forward. Well, pl- and planning your response to allegations means that, first of all, the leadership has to all have this discussion and know yes. this is what we're going to do if there is an accusation. And that should always mean leadership is all informed. Yes. Uh, parties involved are informed and police are notified. That's important. You've, you know, now, again, it's not that it all happens in five seconds, but you've got to walk through each of those steps. And uh, most states require that you call the cops if there's been an accusation of, of this kind of a crime. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you should. I, I just, I'm sorry. I just don't, you know, I can't, I can't imagine a scenario where I wouldn't. No, no, because... We're a different kind of jerk. We're not the kind of jerks that that would uh, that I that. I'm a jerk. Oh, you're <laughs> believe me, you're a jerk. Jeff's a jerk, and I'm a jerk. Jeff, am I a jerk? Well, I didn't want to say nothing. Jeff, yeah. we're like, come on, dude. CG, we, we we're close. all sinners, but like, man, there <laughs> there are people out there that would say, like, well, listen. Uh, and here's what a lot of churches will do. Uh, one kid says this leader in the church has touched me, or this leader's son has touched me. Yeah. They say, all right, quiet, lock it down. We're going to handle it in house. Oh, they do that. Now, listen, um, then they bring the kids together. Are you sorry? Yes, I'm sorry. Do you forgive him? They put them right together. They make the kid forgive. Like, like I wanna... still, I'm sorry. I still count that as some sort of it is abuse. It is absolutely abuse. It's absolutely abuse. So, no. There's... And again, I, I want to stress it. I can't stress it enough. If that is what is happening, shame on you. Yeah. Just. You have no love for the glory of God and for that child. You desire for your reputation and your church to thrive. That's what you care more for that than you do for others and for God, like for the glory of God and for the gospel. I mean, th- this, this all comes down to. And I know I'm rough. I know I'm hard, but trust me, I'm you, trying really you, hard no, not listen, to say a lot of this things. Is when, this is when Jimmy's potty mouth starts. I'm and trying really is, hard. Well, you know you, that. You, you're succeeding. You're uh, doing really you. good. And uh, listen, I wouldn't even, uh, I wouldn't even care uh, because uh, some words are, you know, useful for certain kinds of wickedness. Let me say this all of this comes down to who God is yeah. because he um, think of how God interacts with us. Think of how God loves us. Think of his, how he works for the good of his people. Think about, um, think about the fact that he made everyone in his image yeah. and that those people, all of them, regardless of what they believe or how they behave, all of those people 
uh, deserve respect. Yes. And should be loved and should Dignity. be. Yeah. So this matters. And especially as Christians, it's true for everybody, but it's especially true for Christians that we are called to love and to serve and to care for those who cannot defend or care for themselves. Exactly like you were talking about in Psalm 82. Yeah, right? it is. It is. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So we are. what we're doing is we are following Christ's example. This is what Christ has done for all of us, right? Yes. Uh, we were fatherless. We were child, children of wrath. We weren't children of God. Uh, he, 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 he rescued us. He, he gave us our father. He, uh, though we were afflicted and destitute because of our sin, we were weak and needy and Jesus delivered us and gave us everything we could need. And now we're called to follow him in not just preaching this spiritually, but demonstrating this in the way that we interact with people, especially those people that we can wrap our arms around. So I know that this is heavy. I know that this is, um, hard, but uh, Jeff is somebody that we're really close with yeah. um, and someone with whom we pray and study theology and smoke cigars and laugh and bust chops and have fun. Um, and all of that is why we can have this kind of transparency. I hope, my, I mean, our hope is that you guys who are listening have churches that have this and even better examples of it. Um, and that you are replicating this and encouraging this in other places. And if you don't have it, it can start with you being yeah. the one person who says, well, let's let's talk about something that happened to me. And Jeff, I mean, is there any, for those, like, it's hard for me because like, or it's not hard, I guess, in the sense, but uh, I haven't gone through what you guys have, right? Um, how could you, is there any words of encouragement or any suggestions or tips for those that, maybe have to be able to move forward to discuss with someone in confidence whom they trust. Right. Yeah. Seek out that person, uh, like that friend I have, like with Joe and, and with you, Jimmy, find that one person and talk to them and don't be afraid. You know, for years I hid that shame in yeah. a sense. I mean, some of my family and close friends knew, but I want to talk about it, but you, you do have to, be open about it. You do have to acknowledge it in your life that it did happen and you do have to deal with it and just shoving it deep down inside ain't going to help in any way. And knowing it's, it's not your fault. Right. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's not your fault. I mean, it, in my case, it was a little different in a sense of where, you know, with those issues that happen in ministries where, um, where the children have their trust in adult individuals. Um, Mine was just a random act of violence. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, um, it, w it was different for me. Uh, but um, still b being a victim of this is that you, you do have to talk about it. You do have to deal with it and not just run from it because it, it'll go bad for you if you don't. Well, Jeff, we love you, man. Yeah. Uh, and I love you guys, too. Love you so. as a brother, as a friend, and I love whooping you in canasta. Oh, and so, it happens often. Well, when Jim and I are partners, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you, one day, maybe. Well, when you you'll cheat, be it happens. They we know, don't cheat. They don't. Come on now. You cheat. No. no. We, what just, mean? we just we, know what each other's thinking. That's all the Exactly. Matters. Watch. Hold on. Hold on. Give me a look. Give me. Get, freeze the pile. See? <laughs> That's what he was telling me. I, 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 That's I just, what he was, was telling me right I was, there. I wasn't telling you. I was thinking. It's yeah. cheating. It's, it's called table talk. No, it's not. That's not table talk. I didn't say anything. I just know. There was no talking. You just admitted it. You said, you know what he's Thinking. I know what he's thinking. I know what I'm thinking. I'm not saying anything. Because, yeah. All right, watch this. Watch this, Jimmy. Uh, go ahead. Red, uh, black three. See? <laughs> he was telling me to block the pile right there. <laughs> or how about this one? How about this one? Ready, Joe? Ready? Okay. Oh, uh, time to go all down. I got Dang. all my cards out of my That's hands. That's it right there. Because yeah, he's he going to go out in the next one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we win. We'll do this. I'll do this with Jimmy sometimes. I'll be like, hey, Jimmy, what am I going to do now? And he'll go, you're going to close out them fours. <laughs> I'll start closing out the doors. <laughs> All right. People hate us when we play cards. Hey, big thanks to Justin Bond of J Bond Media. He is our engineer and our audio wizard. He takes care of putting this thing together so that it sounds good. Um, if you have any audio or video needs, be sure and check him out at jbondmedia.com. 
com. If you want to help out the podcast, you can shop at our store. Go to our website, DoctrineAndDevotion.com. There's a little link up there. It says store. Click on that and buy some stuff. Buy some stuff. That'll help us. You can also uh, follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Doc and Devo. You can go to Facebook slash Doctrine and Devotion and like our page. It always makes us feel good. Um, you know what we'd like you to do? Go to iTunes and leave us a review. Or you can use any podcast thing, but just just go go to iTunes and leave us a review. It's not funny, Jeff. What Jeff, is Jeff was saying? saying he was going to give us one star. We already got the two star. We review. got the two star review. No one star reviews. We need an honest. Five-star five review. review. Also, you can head over to our website, DrDevotion.com. You can click on the, so- the Contact Us page, fill out the form, and give us your uh, suggestions, ideas, and your critiques. But while you're there, sign up for our email list. Why? Ugh, I don't want to do email lists. What's good with it? I hate email Because lists. right in your email box, you're going to get Fresh Pod and some, uh, some bonus episodes and... Blog posts. Blog posts. What did you say? I said blog posts. <laughs> no, you blog you posts are coming I weekly heard, now. You I guys heard, okay, are, I, they I, already know. They already I, know. I want coming. you to know that. I want you to know that what I. Best case scenario, you said brog. Okay. I felt I heard. Do you really else. want to be the guy that's talking to me about English? Is uh, really are we going to have this conversation? Fresh pod Dude, you, every you, Monday and Thursday. That's what I thought. Uh, you could mm-hmm. check us out there. Homeboy can't read. Later. Later. Later.